Um, today's speaker is why you're here, and I'm not going to tell you about his credentials. Uh, his credentials speak for himself. That's why he's here, and that's why you're here. What I would like to do is to read something that was that he just wrote very timely on October 28th. Please listen carefully. It is good in these mean times too. It is good in these mean times to notice beauty, savor kindness, and open the soul to what is clear, pure, radiant, and wise. For ignorance, arrogance, petulance, and violence, <clears throat> excuse me, are corrosive and contagious unless we fortify and resist with intentional turnings of the heart toward what is humble, virtuous, and genuine, with innocence beyond naivete. Like that mountain in the orange glow of sunset, that day when we roamed free, or that moon perfect behind a veil of thin clouds as we took a night walk and spoke freely, or the daily encore of gentle dawn light, or bursting forth on that spring by the roadside with a water clear beyond clear, or even in these clear tears shed by mourners with hearts broken open after the latest atrocity about which the powerful will blaspheme with murky promises of thoughts and prayers and nothing more. A tornado of felicity rages, beloved, so do not miss the holiness of beauty. Whenever it appears, for in these mean times, one cannot forget to breathe and push and see. Well, let me start by saying I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and uh, this is my second time with Mountaintop, but you all have kind of moved up in the world. This is a beautiful spot. Great to be in this part of Georgia. Can I let you in on a secret? I have a friend who lives not too far from here, and uh, when he heard I was going to be up here, he invited me up because he knows I'm a trout fisherman. So. Uh, I got to go out on a couple of North Georgia rivers for the first time uh, two days ago. Yesterday, we kind of got rained out, uh, but I, I caught my biggest rainbow trout of my life. Uh, it was 20 inches long, and then the only other fish I caught all day was five inches long. So uh, I, I sort of reached both extremes. Uh, in fact, can I tell you a story? Can you hear me? Well, before we begin, years ago, I was asked to um, introduce uh, a speaker at a big event. And I was a young pastor, and I, I have to, I, I'm not proud of this, but I wanted to do a good job and impress people, right? So, and, and it's a very famous speaker, and so I, I was going, going to introduce him on the last day of the event. It was kind of, he was the finale speaker. So the first day, the organizer comes up to me and says, uh, are you ready for Thursday? Are you ready for Thursday? I said, oh, yeah, piece of cake, no problem. You know, I'm introducing the guy. What's the big deal? So I said, yeah, no problem. That was Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, everything good for Thursday? Yeah, everything's fine. Wednesday, everything looked good for your interview on Thursday? Well, up to then, I'd only heard introduce. I never heard interview. So uh, I said, actually, no, I had no idea he, uh, he, you, I was going to be interviewing him. He says, yeah, and one other thing, he won't be here. Uh, you'll be interviewing him via satellite hookup. And um, so at that point, I did get nervous. And, you know, now I think it would be easier, although technology can always surprise us, right? Um, but uh, you can predict what happened. I got up there, did my introduction, and they couldn't get the satellite hookup. So there is uh, universally understood sign language that goes like this. <laughs> so the guy in the back is going, you know. So a after a while, I was, I really was ready to sort of begin. You know. <laughs> One other quick story. I, I was a pastor for 24 years. I left the pastorate. And I had to decide if I wanted to go to church when I wasn't being paid to go. 
and I moved, we moved to a new state, and uh, I started attending this church, and I went for about 18 months, and nobody spoke to me. Uh, you, know, you know how people say churches are so unfriendly? Like, I was so happy, you know. Uh, <laughs> I came in and sat in the back row and left as soon as things were over, and I had no responsibilities. And uh, so finally, um, I was speaking in another state, and somebody asked me where I lived and where I, if I went to church. And he said, oh, I'm friends with the rector of that church, the pastor of that church. And, um, and I said, uh, uh, by the way, how are we doing? Uh, a few more minutes, good. Uh, I, 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 so I, I was in another state, and this guy says, I'm friends with your rector. I said, yeah, I've never actually met him. He said, dude, you are so busted. Uh, so the next Sunday I was there, as I'm walking out, the, the priest came up and said, uh, I want to have lunch with you. And so we meet for lunch. And uh, he says, you mean to tell me you've come to this church for 18 months and you've never offered to help with anything? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> and I said, look, if I can just come to church and not be responsible for anything, I will be so grateful. I will never complain about anything. If the choir's terrible, I won't complain. I'll just, you know, because I'm just so happy to not be responsible. So um, uh, our, our topic for today is, is dealing with this sense that we all have that the future is going to be different from the present and the past in almost every area of life, but also in religion. And I think a lot of people don't think that's going to be the case in religion. And uh, some of you, um, it, we've all heard speakers who come and tell you what to think, or they try to tell you what to think. My suspicion is you would not be terribly amenable to that kind of a speaker. Um, other people are just say, well, here's what I think. And I'll be happy to do that, but only if you ask. Um, and and each, each session, I'll give a short, or not a short, a medium-sized lecture, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, but uh, my real goal is to try to say, here's some help in how to think about some of these issues. And I, I'm going to assume that we're all at different places. You know, I think a lot of us grew up with kind of conventional thinking about God and religion. And then there's some people who transcend conventional thinking. What I'm hoping uh, we can model today is transcending conventional thinking, but also including it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not to create kind of we're the elite who've transcended and they're the, you know, whatever. But that we can also say, no, we're all in this together. We're, we're all at different places. And could we make a kind of deal in this room that we're, wherever your neighbors are, that's okay with you? Is that, can we sort of make a pact that's okay? Amen? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, because, yeah. If, if we can make sure that it's okay to be where people are, I think then, I'm just offering you some ways to think that might, some, some approaches that might be helpful uh, in your thinking. Um, and and uh, for all of us, the, one of the most humiliating things in the world is to have somebody giving you advice. And uh, in fact, I, I, I read that there have been scientific studies of the brain that giving advice is one of the most pleasurable things a human being can do. <laughs> like it's after sex and a couple other things, but. Um, but receiving advice is one of the most unpleasurable things uh, you, you can do. And, and so I think in, in these cases, the best way to model growth, the best way to encourage growth is to model it. So our own continuing curiosity will help us a great deal. Does that, does that make sense? So wherever we are, we're okay, uh, but we're all in the, in the process of needing to do some rethinking. Uh, a, a good way to start that process is this beautiful poem, uh, by Mary Oliver. Kind of nice to start just about every day with something by Mary Oliver. I love this poem. Dear Lord, I have swept and I have washed, but still nothing is as shining as it should be for you. Under the sink, for example, is an uproar of mice. It is the season of their many children. What shall I do? 
and under the eaves and through the walls, the squirrels have gnawed their ragged entrances. But it is the season when they need shelter, so what shall I do? And the raccoon limps into the kitchen and opens the cupboard while the dog snores. The cat hugs the pillow. What shall I do? Beautiful is the new snow falling in the yard and the fox who is staring boldly up the path to the door. And still I believe you will come, Lord. You will when I speak to the fox, the sparrow, the lost dog, the shivering sea goose. Know that really I'm speaking to you whenever I say, as I do all morning and afternoon, come in, come in. I think that poem captures just the spirit of receptivity. And that whatever it is we're looking for often comes unexpectedly and in humble, surprising ways. That the act of hospitality uh, to other human beings, to other living creatures, ends up being an act of hospitality toward what matters most. Uh, and that includes sometimes new ideas. Uh, one of my mentors said, a mind that expands to embrace a new idea can never shrink back to its former dimension. In other words, even if you reject the idea, the very act of considering it creates some expansion. And that's the spirit in which I'd like us to begin this session. And eventually we'll get some amplification, but uh, I'll do my best until then. Um, God after God. Um, now, I, I'm... Uh, I'm capitalizing the word God to talk about the mystery, whatever it really is. But I'm asking you very consciously with me right now to make a distinction between the mystery, whatever it really is, and our concepts of the mystery. Does, does that make sense? In other words, I want to just talk for a couple minutes about the concept of God or the concepts of God that we have and almost leave aside the real thing, right? If thing is even the right word to use. Think of it like this. Whether or not God exists, God concepts exist. And those God concepts may be the most powerful force on planet Earth. Uh, in other words, if I have a concept that, I know it's hard to imagine anybody having this concept, but if I have a concept that God, whatever God is, only likes some people and hates everybody else and wants to torture everybody else forever, that concept might give me a sense of privilege. It might even be connected to my race or my nationality or my religion. And I could use that sense of privilege to steal people's lands, to, uh, to make people work without pay, to... Suppress, I know it's hard to imagine suppressing votes, but people could possibly do something like that. And, and, and the concept of God that a person has uh, is real and powerful whether anything exists that corresponds to that concept because the very concept exists in people's minds. Does that, does that make sense? And, and so if we can make that distinction, uh, I'd like to just guide us through a couple of observations that might be helpful in your thinking about God. First, our understandings of God change as we develop. They change personally. They change communally, meaning for religious congregations or denominations or whole religions. And they change culturally. As, as we develop, as we change, our, our concepts of God change. I wrote about this in a book that they have out there called The Great Spiritual Migration, where I used a very personal example. I said, look, when you're a little baby, um, before you have any concept, before you have any language, you can't, you have no theology. All you have is the experience of diaper rash and, and the, the desire to have some more milk. You know, you have a very simple realm, or very, maybe very deep, but we have no words for it. And whatever concept of God we develop at that very early stage, it's located primarily in our mother and our father, who, in a sense, when we scream, they come. And when they come, we feel better. And that primal understanding, and I think you'll agree with me, this is real. That when you're an infant and you're in need and you cry out, usually somebody comes and at least brings you comfort. And you're not alone 
and in the pain of diaper rash at the same time. Um, so I call that God 1.0. And some people, that's the only God they ever have their entire life. And in hey, we're back. Uh, <clears throat> great. That's pretty good. And I'm sure they'll perfect that in a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks for your... Something got better and then it got worse. Let's see. Hey, that's pretty good. Let's give a round of applause. Fantastic. Perfect. And when you find, this is not everybody, but when you find a lot of people who are really angry at religion, it's because they, their idea of God was the one who comes and always makes you feel better. I, when adults use this. I sometimes call this the candy man God, right? But the God who always has prizes for you and presents for you. And, and when life doesn't turn out that way, a lot of people feel I've really been let down. Now, what happens in a lot of, for a lot of us, though, is we get that, those basic needs met. And we learn to trust our parents uh, and feel their love. And then we get a little bit older and we might have a sibling. And I'm going to guess that the next concept of God that we have is God is the moral summons that tells you to stop hitting your sister and stop punching your brother and stop stealing your brother's Halloween candy. And I'm still not over that in some ways. But anyway, uh, and, and this idea of, be nice to your immediate family. I call that in Great Spiritual Migration, God 2.0. And then you get a little bit older and you go to school and you have to learn to stay in line and you have to learn to be quiet and you have to learn to stay in those uncomfortable seats. I remember being in fourth grade th thinking, I'm only in fourth grade. I've got eight more years of this sitting in these chairs from morning till night. I don't know how I'm going to survive. Uh, but there it is. And, and in a certain sense, I think our concept of God gets associated with the one who wants us to keep the rules. And then we get a little bit older and we, um, uh, we, we get baptized or confirmed or whatever. We enter a religious community. And we have this sense that we, our religious community has the inside track with God. It's kind of the God of, the, of a certain, I call it an exclusive we. Um, and... And uh, that stretches us in a certain sense beyond selfishness. We start caring about a larger community. And a whole lot of people stay there their whole lives. And I think one of our big problems now is that most religion is working on either God 1.0. By the way, God 1.0 makes a lot of money for the prosperity gospel people who, you know, it's, it's in some ways that God 1.0 who they're, I hate to say it, but sometimes selling access to, right? Or at least, at least marketing access to. And, um, and, uh, but a whole lot of our religions are at this God 4.0 stage. And, and, and all the experiences, that is love, but it's love among us. And the other, uh, we will kill them to protect us because our God will kill them to protect us. And then I think some are struggling to enter into what I call a God 5.0 which is God of, uh, of the universe and a God of, of a universal uh, we. And, and so that's one way I wrote about this. And I, in another book, I, I wrote about it in terms of uh, intellectual development that happens in communities. And in that book, Naked Spirituality, I talk about uh, how communities almost segregate people around their views of God. And so um, if you're at the, the simplicity level, um, God is all about us and them, right and wrong. This is the religion of dualism. And uh, God is the one on the right side, and then there's all these other forces on the, on the other side. And, uh, and in a lot of churches, you do really great until, and, and it could be mosques or synagogues or gurdwaras or anything, you do really great until you uh, start to move into that next stage of complexity. And you think, gosh, I've actually met a couple Muslims, and they're not like they told me in that in my church. And, and, and so now the world gets a little more complex. And if you move into complexity, you're no longer welcome in the world of simplicity. So then you have to change denominations. Maybe you can get away with changing congregations, uh, but you've got to go somewhere else. And then you spend some time there, and, uh, and then that even stops working. And you reach a stage of perplexity where you need 
permission to doubt and question. And very often people leave religion entirely. And I, I really think it, there have been almost no congregations uh, who are, can take you beyond complexity. Uh, a few were there to hold you in perplexity. And we had very, very few that could get to this next stage of harmony where, where th there's this larger understanding of God that has room for both faith and doubt and uh, where beliefs are held in a different way. So uh, obviously this was of interest to me. I read about it in this book um, and uh, the different kinds of God that we might think of in these different stages. I, had a, I, I borrowed the work of Ken Wilber. Many of you may be familiar with Ken Wilber who, who's been paying a lot of attention to uh, something called spiral dynamics, a, a, a sense of as individuals and as cultures and communities that were on this sort of ascending spiral and they use all different kinds of color schemes to picture these different stages. And at whatever stage people are, they have a concept of something transcendent. Uh, and many call it God. Um, and then, uh, uh, so if, we, if that's all we, we start with, that's enough to just realize that our understandings of God change as we develop personally, communally, and culturally. Just give you a quick story of this. I, I was uh, a freshman in college, and I was invited to this group. Um, now, I need to tell you, I grew up, uh, I grew up hardcore fundamentalist. You know what? You, you have a sense you especially folks you know, here in Georgia have a sense of what that means. Uh, uh, can I just tell you, I, I grew up so fundamentalist that I thought the Southern Baptists were really liberal. Um, I, my, my friends across the street were Southern Baptists, and they just had a lot more fun than we had. And I went to my mom one day, and I said, Paul and David have, have ice cream socials at their church. Why don't we have an ice Like, they just got together and ate ice cream, and they put gooey toppings on it. And, and they didn't do that as the prelude or postlude to a sermon and lots of hymn singing. They just had ice cream and went home. And uh, I said to my mom, why don't we do that? And she said, um, that my mother's a wonderful, dear person. Uh, she's still alive. She's actually in hospice care now. Uh, I've got to keep checking my phone because she's, she's not, not doing too well right now. But uh, So what I'm about to say sounds harsh. She wasn't that way at all. But here's what she said. Uh, we don't do social things. We do spiritual things. And I said, what's so bad about social things? It might lead to socialism. Now, listen, <laughs> she didn't even know what that meant, but she'd heard it. And she was sincere, and she belonged to this community, right? So, but uh, we all grow. You know, we all grow, and, and these things change. Um, second, our understandings of God change in relation to our imaginary. This is a term that was made popular by the great philosopher Charles Taylor, uh, but a lot of folks are beginning to use it. And by imaginary, they don't mean make-believe. They mean the series of images that are part of our, uh, our universe. They're, they're images we can reach for. They're images we can make use of. And, um, and, and along with images are stories that we can live by. Uh, and and we, we latch on to these images and we latch on to these stories according to our current needs and anxieties and challenges and dreams and so on. So certain images really work for us at different stages. I think I can explain this just for people familiar with the Bible. If you can imagine hunter-gatherers who are moving from place to place, finding berries and nuts and protein of various, uh, various sorts. Uh, and they, they, they have to go where the food is. They don't have much in the way of possessions. What do they have to be in tune with? They have to be in tune with creation. They have to know when the fish come up the stream, when the birds of this species show up, when the, the, the berries of this type and the nuts of this type are, are available. They have to have such deep sensitivity. And when you encounter uh, people who are not too far removed from being hunter-gatherers, they talk about the spirits that are in everything. And, and they might have a supreme spirit, a great spirit, as in Native American uh, uh, religions or many African religions. But they, they, they live in a world that's spiritual because they're so close to it. Um, and so... That idea of the creator spirit 
is, is almost universal among hunter-gatherer people. It's no surprise that when hunter-gatherer people start domesticating cattle and goats and sheep, that they start to think of God in a more shepherdly way. They could never think of God as a king when they're hunter-gatherers because kings didn't freaking exist, right? There just weren't any kings. You would never call God a king. Um, and so you can think of God as creator, God as shepherd, uh, and become agriculturalists. You think of God as the gardener, or you think of God as being related to the seasons that you're so dependent on. Your imaginary would only include those kind of images. Um, you, you trend, what, what very often happens is those agriculturalists um, start to get homes and barns and wealth, and then raiders come in to steal from you. And so you start getting a group of agriculturalists to work together, and you get somebody who's the warlord to protect you. And feudalism, it turns out, not we know about European feudalism, but broader, broader speaking, coalitions of agriculturalists with warlords to protect them and extract wealth from them. You know, that's very, very common. And when you read the word Lord in the Bible, you know, um, th that's an image of God, that God is kind of like the one who protects us agricultural people from those other raiders and invaders over there. And then you could think when people get in larger cities where we need to have codes of conduct so we aren't always in each other's faces and, and having constant conflict. And by the way, if you know the Bible, you're just seeing, I'm just talking right through the first 11 chapters of Genesis right now. The memory of going through these various stages. Um, you can see why you need God as a lawgiver. Um, your concept of God will be primarily around lawgiver when you're a city dweller. And then, but then you find out, well, this, this city-state goes to war against this city-state. And so now we need kings to unite these city-states so that they will have laws that apply to all of them so that they won't go to war against each other. Now you'll start to think of God as king, right? To speak of a kingdom of God when you're a hunter-gatherer agriculturalist makes no sense at all. It's not part of your imaginary. And then when um, various nations go to war against each other, and then you're looking for an emperor, or you're maybe not looking for one, but one's looking for you because he needs some labor and resources. And, and now you have sort of the God as the emperor, the supreme being, the one at the very top of the, uh, the, the chain of dominance. And, um, uh, and you can imagine then when God's, when God is associated with the elite at the top of the pyramid, everybody else at the bottom starts praying for a God to liberate them from. Now, that's a very different understanding of God than the law and order God. Um, and then uh, that would be part of your imaginary. And I think in a place where we are now, where we're having to imagine an ecological civilization, it makes perfect sense that we would need a concept of God as uh, ironically very similar to the concept that the hunter-gatherers may have had, of some divine presence, some spirit that's present everywhere in everything. Now, look, I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with any of these, but just to understand, I think you, you would agree. As people need new ideas of God, their, their concept of God uh, can evolve. I mean, you think uh, about what's happened just in, in history uh, that we, you know, that's available to us, uh, the, the, the uh, three-layered uh, understanding of the universe that you see in, in so much of the, uh, of the biblical text. Uh, they, that was their imaginary. That was their narrative. That was their framework in which they would understand God. That evolved over time. Ptolemy came along, and you ended up with this Ptolemaic worldview that was deeply, deeply embraced by the Christian religion and, and they understood God in terms of the idea that the earth is in the center and there are 10 concentric crystalline spheres. They actually believed that these were like glass, clear as crystal. We were, we were in, in literally an aquarium, you know, like an aquarium of glass. And in fact, there are medieval woodcuts of angels standing on one of these spheres. And they knew that uh, they because they the TV stations weren't very good then, and they actually looked at the stars quite often. Um, they, they knew that, that these, uh, what we would call meteors and asteroids, they actually came closer to us 
than the sun or certain planets. Or, or, um, and so uh, there's pictures of angels opening trap doors in the crystal spheres so that a comet can go through or a meteor can go through. And, and so, uh, by the way, those crystal spheres of that Ptolemaic worldview, um, we have residues of them in Christian worship today. One of my favorite old hymns. Remember, um, this is my father's world uh, and to my listening ears, creation sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. That's a memory of that understanding of the universe. Then um, Copernicus comes along and you hear the sound of crashing glass because that old model of the universe failed. And, you know, the first, uh, the, the word inerrancy related to the Bible did not begin with Protestant fundamentalists. It began with Catholics uh, in, uh, in the decades after Copernicus because they just felt to go from that universe to that universe, even though they look pretty similar to us, moving the earth from the earth to the sun in the center had huge concepts to their imaginary. And it meant that God was different uh, because, uh, uh, you know, he, now God is in a different habitat, so to speak. And then uh, that, that universe is augmented and, and becomes way more complicated with the watchmaker universe of Sir Isaac Newton and others, uh, where God is like the, the engineer who designs the mechanisms. And, and then, my gosh, by the time we get to the 20th century and better telescopes and Edwin Hubble and Einstein and so on. Now we're in a radically different universe. And then you think what's happened since then. Where, do you understand that the early cosmologists in some ways weren't even asking questions that included time? It was assumed that the universe, whatever shape it has, it's the shape it always had and always will have. And then in the 20th century, we start having this understanding of deep time. And, and this is such a different universe. And in some ways, this is our problem when I speak of God after God. For a lot of people, in fact, for everybody virtually, the word God is defined in those old universes, in an old imaginary. And so when people say to me today, I don't believe in God, I don't even notice. It's because you have every reason not to believe in God if you're talking about one of the gods shaped in one of the earlier imaginaries. Does that make sense in one of the earlier um, universes? Um, but then the question remains, how do we, th is there any way to think of God in this universe? Um, uh, a, a universe, uh, this is one of, I know it looks very ancient, but this is one of the newest ways of describing the universe because now we realize that, uh, we think that 70% of the universe is dark energy, 25% is dark, cold dark matter, 4% is invisible atoms, Hydrogen and helium make up 0.5%. And everything that we think of as real makes up 0.1% of the universe. Um, it's staggering, you know, that, that we're still in a universe that's, that is constantly changing. And when we say God in these different universes, we mean something different. Uh, I, I, now there's this whole group. I, it doesn't show up terribly well on this photograph, but... Um, you can barely make out uh, the, uh, the, the Buddha, a statue of, uh, of the Buddha there. Oh, you can see it best there. Um, and, uh, and what this is, this is a whole area that scientists and religious people are coming together to talk about the idea that consciousness may be the ultimate reality. That consciousness may not simply be the uh, sort of an emergent property, uh, which it certainly is in in, in the physical universe, but that consciousness may be the actual environment into which the universe evolves. And, uh, uh, and the irony is, physicists start talking about this, and suddenly they, they find a, a, a Hindu monk on a mountaintop who's been thinking this for, you know, 800 years or something. Um, but uh, this, we're, we're still in a dynamic uh, era in understanding the universe. And you just think of what Christian theology has had to cope with in the last 500 years. Um, and one radical shift after another. And the fact is, Christianity has, has evolved, but has been pretty slow. If we could use evolutionary terminology, 
the environment has been changing much faster the, than the adaptations. And my suspicion is that is the story behind something like Mountaintop Lectures, where a whole group of you more and more felt every Sunday I go to church, when I walk through those doors, I feel I'm stepping into another universe, the universe of my great, great, great grandparents or something. I, am I allowed to think about God and meaning and purpose in the universe that I actually live in? And then here's what gets weird. And then to think the universe that my grandchildren will live in may be really different than mine. So with that, um, I think what we're really left with right now, it, it, to take all the complexity I've just given you and, and pre present it in very simple terms, is we've got gods of protection who are trying to keep, who in a sense need to keep the old universe alive because that's the universe in which they evolved. And then we might say gods of projection that suit us right now because they project an ideal image of what we hope to become. And, and we're trying to project an image of God that actually solves the problems that we really have right now, that, that instead of making us afraid to want to make the world of whatever nation great again, meaning like it used to be, like the world that we used to fit into. No, we're, there, there's, I'm calling it gods of projection that try to help us bring us to somewhere where we need to be. Now, everything I've said right now, it doesn't matter whether God exists. These concepts exist. And that is part of what we're dealing with, um, that our understandings of God change as we develop personally, culturally, and uh, communally. Um, uh, and then our, uh, and, and that our understandings of God change in relation to our imaginary, this universe that we live in. Third, our understandings of God change depending on who's part of the conversation. So if people like this are the only people in the conversation, you can predict certain outcomes. If, uh, if people like this are included in the conversation, um, our understanding of God is going to change. And if people like this are included uh, in the con uh, conversation, these are some of the great uh, Latin American theologians. If people like this, some of the world's great Asian and indigenous theologians uh, who probably have been, at this moment, uh, have been appreciated the least by people uh, like us. Um, and then especially you start thinking about the theologians doing work as feminist and women, womanist uh, theologians who are really grappling with the male domination of the religious conversation. And then you add uh, people like this who say, yeah, but even if you've got male-dominated theology and female-dominated theology, what about trans theology? And what about queer theology? And what about LGBT theology in general? And, and these voices are... are uh, what happens when they're included uh, in the conversation? Um, and, and then you start to realize that everything, all of our God concepts really have adjectives in front of it. There, there was something called the social gospel, but nobody talked about the fact that it was reacting against the industrial gospel. The industrial gospel was just the gospel. See? And, and the same goes with liberation theology was really a, a reaction against an oppression theology. And all of these different theologies represent struggles to think about God in fresh ways as new people are not just included in the conversation, but are sometimes um, leading the conversation. So our understanding of God changes as we change, and it changes according to our imaginary, the, the universe we live in and the universe we need, and our understandings of God change and deepen depending who's part of the con conversation. And they also change in conversation with other religions and other philosophies and other cultures. If you think of Christian history, it, it, again, it starts as Judaism. And, and, and uh, then it begins to engage with Roman politics. And, and then it redefines itself in terms of, of Greek, especially Neoplatonist theology. And then it corrects itself through an exchange with Islam, which is, I think, one of the parts of Christian history that is most interesting. If you think, if, if you were to oversimplify it, you'd say it's something like this, that in the first four centuries of Christianity, 
we, in a sense, in Western Christianity, redefined ourselves so thoroughly in Greek categories that we have basically been a subset of Greek, the, Greek philosophy ever since. Not just Greek philosophy, Neoplatonist Greek philosophy. And then in the Middle Ages, here's what had happened. You remember, in fact, some of your relatives um, were Goths and Visigoths. I don't mean Goths from the 90s. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, and, uh, and what happened is writing was this special technology that certain people had. And it was seen as a tool of oppression. And so when people who didn't have writing invaded the people who did have writing, they tried to destroy it. And so they would burn down the libraries. And, and this might be hard for us to believe, but for centuries, uh, the first 10 centuries of, of Christian history, we knew there was a dude named Aristotle, but we had none of Aristotle's writings. All of those writings had been burned uh, in, by, by the invaders. We had none of those, but guess who had them? Muslims had them. And Muslim scholars and Muslim libraries preserved those. And so what happens is uh, you, uh, you have these Christian monks and these Muslim scholars having secret liaisons at night in Spain. And like this Christian monk comes up and says, I'll give you two Platos for an Aristotle. <laughs> and, and they start trading manuscripts. And uh, many of you would know the name Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is one of the you know, leading medieval theologians who felt that Christianity had gone too far in its relationship with Plato and felt that a big dose of Aristotle could help get us back on course. And even though he wrote a m huge tome called Summa Contra Gentiles, which really is uh, a summary against the Muslims, in conversation with the Muslims, he gained resources that cha changed Western Christianity. Um, and, and then we engaged with uh, science. And then we re-engaged with Judaism after the Holocaust because it just, you know, in the lifetime of some of us in this room, um, when we understood the consequences of 1,900 years of anti-Semitism and where that had led, uh, it, it really created a change and a new level of exchange where Christians decided to let Jews tell them about the Jewish scriptures. Uh, kind of interesting. And, and then encounters with Vedic faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and others. And, and in the last few years, really interesting dialogues with atheism. And, uh, and I think and your speaker last time was, uh, was Greta Vosberg, who is one of the people who's engaging in this. And all of these conversations are going on. And let me just speak personally. Um, in the last few years, I've been part of a little fellowship. And our fellowship includes uh, rabbis and uh, Muslim leaders and uh, Buddhist. In fact, here's a combination for you. An African-American Buddhist anti-racism activist. There is a, 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 you know. But can I just tell you, these are friends of mine who I have learned so much from. And my understanding of life and religion and God and the universe, it has been deeply, deeply enriched by these conversations. And, um, and it's, it's not some simple thing. It's a profound thing. And now I realize this has been happening all along. So our understandings of God change as we develop. Our understandings of God change according to our imaginary. Our understandings of God change depending on who's part of the conversation. And it, when people who have different conversations going begin sharing their thoughts, and then our understandings of God periodically collapse. Um, when all of these changes happen, our understandings of God collapse. And some recover and some don't. And this is the moment I think we're in right now. The guy who's written about this is a brilliant Catholic Irish uh, philosopher named Richard Carney. And Richard Carney says, so much depends, of course, on what we mean by God. If transcendence is indeed a surplus of meaning, it requires a process of endless interpretation. The absolute requires pluralism to avoid absolutism. Uh, if you're a philosopher, you know that is a mouthful right there. And if that went right over your head, don't worry about it. But I'll just tell you, that to me is a magnificent sentence. Um, and, uh, 
uh, in, in his book, Anatheism, which is a play on theism, atheism, having a baby. Uh, 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 and Anna means theism again, or theism after atheism. Uh, he, he quotes Jew Jewish writer Eddie Hillison uh, from the concentration camp at Westerbrook, shortly before her death wrote, we are lost permanently and for all time unless we provide an alternative, a dazzling and dynamic alternative with which to start afresh somewhere. In the sense after the Holocaust that we, and after World War, two, World War War, two World Wars, this sense that we've screwed this up so badly that we, we, th what we need are not just minor tweaks. And, and the terrifying thought in my mind is you hope that we won't go worse than the Holocaust. But this is why a lot of us, it's why I wrote the poem that was read a little earlier. Uh, I'm reading the papers every day and I'm seeing we could do worse. We could do worse in a year. We could do worse in five years. We could do worse in 10 years. And then you add the idiocy of not paying attention to climate change and you start to, you start to think the devastation, the death toll it's, it's unimaginable. And, and any gods that let that kind of thing happen on their watch deserve to die. You understand what I'm saying? They, they deserve to be left behind. And if there's going to be any meaning to a word God after what's already happened and what still could happen, uh, I think uh, Eddie has it right. Uh, we need a dazzling and dynamic alternative. Um, uh, Richard says, anatheism is not an atheism that wishes to rid the world of God, rejecting the sacred in favor of the secular, nor is it just a theism that seeks to rid God of the world, rejecting the secular in favor of the sacred. No, nor finally is it a pantheism, ancient or new age, that collapses the secular and the sacred into one, denying any distinction between transcendent and imminent. Anatheism does not say the sacred is the secular. It says it is in the secular, through the secular, toward the secular, Anatheism speaks of interanimation between the sacred and the secular, but not of fusion or confusion. They are inextricably interconnected, but never the same thing. And so he, this is his attempt to struggle with what it means to speak of God after the traditional concepts of God have collapsed. Now you say, what if we fail? What if the old concepts of God fall apart and we find... Uh, and, and we decide all of those gods are genocidal, geocidal, suicidal, to hell with them all. And we say, and, and we say we've got to find that fresh, dazzling alternative, and we don't find it. Um, and I'll just say, this became much more real to me, uh, I don't know what it is now, 14, 15, 16 months ago, um, when I was at Sh Charlottesville, uh, not that far up the road. Um, and I was asked to be part of the clergy witness against the Unite the Right rally there. And um, can I just say, uh, I, that, was a, uh, that was an experience that marked me for the rest of my life. Not just the day, but in the days before and after. Um, can I just say, if you, depending on which news station you watch, you might think this group called Antifa are the worst people to ever exist. I, I, I would have to tell you, I think those people saved several of our lives uh, that day. Um, but I'm not defending everything they say and do. But um, uh, when you realize that fascism is really a thing, and there's a whole lot of young white men who are really excited about it, uh, one of these Antifa organizations, I mean, this sounds incredible but they had people who became spies in these white supremacist groups. And so in the days immediately before and after the Charlottesville event, I, because the organizers of the event are friends of mine and because I agreed to be there, they sent me screenshots from the communications going on behind the scenes with these different people. And all I want to tell you is, they are really well organized and they are really serious. And what it said to me, well, I, I started doing a bunch of research into these white supremacist groups. Um, 
And uh, there's a, a young man who is considered sort of one of their bright young stars, rising stars, and he left a couple of years ago, and he's devoted his life now to trying to oppose these groups and stir people away from them. But he, he was asked in an interview, what attracted you to white supremacy? He said three things. Every person I ever met in white supremacy was attracted by three things. They were attracted by a desire for meaning, purpose, and belonging. And, and the thing I, I think we have to realize is that human beings, as they need air, they need water, they need protein, fats, carbohydrates, they need meaning, belonging, and purpose. And if they don't find it in a healthy way, um, there are plenty of other options that are appealing. And if people like us only complain about the failure of the old gods, let me just tell you, somebody else will fill the vacuum. And this is why I think we have a really important work to do in, in gatherings like this, when we understand that our concepts of God are constantly changing um, according to our understanding of the universe and our, the, uh, the images that we have available to us and, and according to who we include in the conversation and what different conversations we're willing to bridge together to talk and listen together. And, and when we understand that there will be periods of collapse and sometimes that collapse is absolutely necessary. Um, and then we say, okay, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to help this? Uh, what, what happens next? Is there some understanding of God or the divine or something that can be uh, salvaged from the wreckage of what religion uh, has become and is becoming and how the word God is weaponized in these days? So much so that I'm a committed Christian. I spent 24 years of my life as a pastor I, my, my work is to communicate about God. And I hate to say the word right now because it just feels the word is so tainted and polluted. And, uh, and, but what are we going to do about it? Because it's an existential challenge. And what I'd like to do right there is I would like to just stop and we've got plenty of time now for some questions and we can take this in any direction uh, you would like to. Can we ask this? I will repeat your question. Um, if you will do your very best to make it really short, I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. And I don't, I won't, I don't mean to be rude, but it happens to, you know, if, if you go on a little too long, I'll say, can you give me your question? Okay, so I'm not, don't take that as an insult. I just want to be sure we can get to a lot of people. So uh, if you're nervous about asking the first question, we'll go to the second question right there. Yeah. So, uh, the question is, how do I reflect on Scripture? Oh, good, we have a mic. I didn't know that. Great, fantastic. Um, how do I reflect on Scripture uh, in light of what we've talked about? Um, in the book that they have out there, Great Spiritual Migration, I create this little matrix. Um, and I won't go into all that now. But it's the best way I've found to talk about Scripture. But if I can use my, um, my imagine, <laughs> this is another use of the word imaginary, my imaginary uh, a blackboard here, a chalkboard here. Um, we used to say that there are only two ways to read the Bible, a conservative way and a liberal way. And you were in the, this bucket or in this bucket. Well, the first thing we should do is say, that's not actually two buckets. It's actually a line. And people are at all different points along that line. And in fact, a lot of people slide back and forth, depending on which part of the Bible they're reading and who they are. So let's call that, and let's not say conservative and liberal. Let's say literal and literary. Literal is saying I'm looking for facts. Literary is saying I'm looking for meaning. Does that, does that dis distinction make, place? Uh, make sense? And then let's stick a vertical uh, axis across that. So first we've got the horizontal from literal to literary. Uh, and then vertical axis will start on the bottom with what I'm going to call innocent. And innocent means you approach the text, taking it at face value, and you don't really question it. Um, and then I'm going to pay, take a middle ground, and I'm going to call that critical. Um, that's the zone where you critique the text. You say, I'm taking this text seriously. 
I'm going to ask questions about its sources. I'm going to ask qu questions about how it came to be. No question is outlawed in the critical text. And um, what I think the world I was born into only had four zones. They had literal, they had uh, literal innocent and literal critical. And then they had literary innocent and literary critical. Um, but I think now we have to add a third zone on top. And I'm going to call it integral. And by integral, I mean you try to integrate the needs and desires in those first two. And where I, th so to summarize, what I think we have to do is we have to, we have to model, this is my opinion, moving from most people being in the literal innocent zone all the way up to the literary integral zone. And um, so one of the books I know they have out there that I wrote grappling with this is, uh, I, I, the first version of it was called We Make the Road by Walking, and it's an overview of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I don't think they have that out there. But then it was that was turned from 52 chapters one a week into like daily readings. And so the one they have out there is called Seeking Aliveness. And that's my attempt to try to tell the biblical story from up in that zone. I think that helps us. What it does is it lets the Bible in a sense, remember my different, I won't flip back to it, but my different models of the universe. And remember how that last universe was shaped like a bell or one of the last ones? But because they put time, they realized the universe changes its form through time. You, you no snapshot ever captures the universe. And so what's happened, I think, in this way of reading the Bible is now we're seeing the Bible, one of its greatest values is that it shows us change over time. And that's what I, what I think where we can go. One of our great problems is that for generations, we've educated pastors to move from innocent to critical to post-critical or integral. But when they, if they went back and tried to preach that in a church, they'd get fired because the people were being told and been taught that it's only innocent literal that's allowed. Uh, I think that will help us. And can I just say, uh, before this next question, can I just say that in my opinion, as a guy who grew up fundamentalist and we were force fed the Bible whether we wanted it or not, when you read the Bible in that literary integral space, it is absolutely fascinating. And the opposite of the kind of oppressive, dominating uh, text that it was over here. Yes. You know, so I'm I'm going to examine, or at least I'm curious about yes. your own um, concept of God, because uh, as I read a lot of your work, um, I I gather I get to the point in some of your books where I feel that you're telling me that God has agency. Uh, an agency then implies an agent, and so I'm sort of curious yeah. how. Maybe that's enough of the yeah. question. No, that's a really setup. great question. Yeah. And can I just um, quick tangent before I answer your question? Um, a couple of years ago, I the woman who handles all my travel. We've worked together for 20 years, and I've only met her like three times because of the internet. You know, you can just it can be that way. So I don't even know exactly where she lives now. But I get a phone call from her, and she says, uh, she's a Texan. She says, Brian, I just sent you an email. I think you better answer right away. <laughs> and I said, okay, what, what's going on? She says, all I'll say is it's from the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, as a Protestant boy, I felt I was being called to the principal's office, you know. So, uh, and I'm going to be very discreet here, but make a long story short. One of my books, I wrote a book called A New Kind of Christianity that was translated into Italian. And... You know, you as an author, you have no choice what the title they give your book is, especially in translation. So the Italian title is 10 Questions the Church is Afraid to Handle or Answer or something or Ask. And, um, and of course, in Italy, if you say the church, it means the Catholic Church. So I'm thinking, oh, boy. So uh, we end up in a phone call. And it was brilliant. Uh, Fluent and fluent in English, uh, Italian fellow, and he said to me, uh, he said, I, "I wanted you to know that I'm using your book in I forget what he said five of the or 
some number of the pontifical academies in Rome. He says, you're asking exactly the questions that we need to ask. You're right. The church is afraid. So I thought, wow, that's a good title. <laughs> um, but then he said, um, he said, because of where I work, I am not able to speak freely. Um, and he said, I wonder if you could and I could enter into private forum. Private forum is a term in the Catholic Church that basically it's a little bit like if you remember the Get Smart sitcom, it's like the Dome of Silence. Uh, and it's a place where you can say, let's entertain thoughts that the church may consider heretical, but we need space to speak freely. And so he said, would you be willing to enter into open forum with me? And so we had a, a series of uh, phone conversations and email conversations, and that was the question he wanted to talk about. He basically said, I can't pray anymore because I don't believe that God's relationship to the universe is a relationship where there is something good that should happen, but God will not allow it unless somebody asks for, for it. He says, that just doesn't make sense to me. And I'm losing the idea of a God that even would interact with the universe in that way. And so, um, so that was the conversation that we had, just to say that that is a great way to phrase the question, does God have agency um, in the universe? So I want to do two things. First, I want to answer it not what I think, but just a way that might be helpful. And whether or not God even exists, God concepts have agency only as they're embodied in human beings who organize with other human beings and increase agency through human beings. That's true whether, God, whether there is any correspondent to the concepts of God that exist in our minds as a sort of collective consciousness in some ways. Um, they, that very much has agency. And so now to take that to what I believe, I believe whatever God is, God is not primarily outside of space and time in the universe, occasionally reaching in to flip something or whatever. Whatever God is, I believe is intrinsic to the universe inherent in creation. And I believe that however that works, it works through human beings. Uh, and so in a bizarre way, you, you remember how in the gospel stories, and again, I don't, it, when I'm operating up here in this literal integral space, whether those stories literally happened or not, is of no interest to me at all. What's in, of interest to me is the meaning that that story would tell. And so if, uh, in, in the Gospels, you read all these stories where Jesus heals people, and then what he ought to say is, only I could fix this. This is all about me. Notice my power. Ascribe some doctrines to me. I did this for you. But consistently in the Gospels, he says, your faith has made you well. Keep quiet about me. Your faith has made you well. And it seems to me this is the thrust, actually, I think that's happening in that unfolding bell of the scriptures that actually uh, we are the embodiment of Christ by the time you get very far in the New Testament. And I think the resurrection that really counts is the resurrection of that holy love and energy and forgiveness and courage and commitment and creativity that we ascribe to God being embodied in us. So that's where I would see the agency working. I, I don't mean that in a reductionist way, but I, that's the realist way I, I currently am able to see that. Um, does that. I'm not asking you to agree, but uh, that's just how I'm working. Um, another question back here. And you just mentioned uh, Christ for the first time. Uh, where do you see uh, Jesus as in the concept of, of Savior and Son of God fitting into the oh. evolution of God? Yes, what a great question. So let me just say, is, is I, uh, the question is, how do I see Jesus as Savior and Son of God fitting in with this concept? Um, boy, I wish... I wish this is all we were going to talk about all day, but because it's uh, really important and interesting. And 
So let me just say again, I, I grew up fundamentalist. I'm sort of warning you. You know, I grew up fundamentalist. Uh, it's like saying I, I had a really bad flu and I've tried to, you know, wash my hands and I don't want you to catch it. But, uh, but, but I, I say that because I was taught to really pay attention to the Bible. And one of the terrible things that happens is if you really pay attention to the Bible itself, you start asking questions. And so one of the things you realize, for example, the word Christ, you say, well, where does that word come from? And then you do a little research and you say, oh, Christ means anointed. It means the one who is smeared with oil. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's a way that you pick somebody. It's like we would say a duly elected representative. Uh, you know, how do you have authority to become the governor of Georgia? No, that's a really good question. I know. <laughs> but you're supposed to actually win an election and get the majority of votes and have the votes accurately counted and, and, and have no shenanigans on either side to make that happen. I'm just speaking theoretically here. <laughs> But, you know, you'd say somebody who was elected has the authority to lead. And in their world, they would say somebody who was appropriately smeared, uh, by, um, which was the, the way of identifying a leader. So then you think, uh, and what were you smeared to be, to be the king? Well, what is, how does that make sense? Well, if you have the emperor in Rome oppressing you, then your, your dream is that somebody's going to come and liberate you from oppression. And so you're waiting for the person who God has smeared with oil, legitimizing them as the liberator from this kind of oppression. And so if that's what the word Christ means in that context, then, then the what I, way I would translate it is the liberating king. Who's the liberator? The one with the actual spiritual authority to do the right kind of liberating. So if I use that word in relation to Christ, I think, yeah, that makes all, if I use that word Christ in relation to Jesus, I think he was advocating a kind of liberation that didn't involve killing all of your enemies. He was involving a kind of liberation that involved transformation of both the oppressor and the oppressed. Uh, I, I think I should say transformation of both the oppressed and the oppressor because ultimately it's the oppressed who actually transform the oppressor, right? It's, it's the reversal of power. Um, and then you take a term, uh, son of God. I think before you take the term son of God, you have to take the term son of man. And um, because it's way more common in the gospels. And, and this is a long story we don't have time to go into, but you're asking my, my opinion, and you can tell I'm happy to give it. Uh, but the word son of means the next generation. And the word man means humanity. And I think that phrase, son of man, derives its primary meaning in Jesus' day from the book of Daniel, where it's both an individual in a vision and a community in the interpretation. So the real, so the term son of man or new generation of humanity in the book of Daniel is then identified as the saints, plural, the holy people of the Most High. And so if uh, what I would say son of man means, if Jesus understands himself to be saying, I'm coming to you ahead of my time, ahead of our time. I'm modeling the next generation of humanity. I'm trying to live the way the next generation of human beings should live. That would be son of man. If you want to take the word son of God, uh, uh, many of you are familiar with Dominic Crossan, who's written so brill brilliantly about this, but... Uh, all the Caesars, the, the last couple of Caesars before Jesus claimed to be sons of God, of the gods. And, and so for Jesus to take that term is really like uh, subversive, uh, almost political theater to say, I'm, I'm Caesar, but I'm going to reverse Caesar. Instead of gaining power by killing, I'm going to gain power by healing. And instead of gaining power by starving people, I'm going to gain power by feeding them. And instead of gaining power by depriving them from health care, I'm going to try to... Anyhow, we won't go there. But, uh, but that term son of God then becomes a really powerful way of saying, um, you want to know how things ought to run? It's not by that pyramid economy there. It's by a whole different system. So all of those terms are still meaningful, deeply meaningful to me. And I'm being honest. I'm not just saying this, you know, 
as a defensive mechanism. But when I read the New Testament, I think that's what's really there now. Like, I think that's a, a very legitimate way of reading the New Testament now. Um, and uh, so I think I'm being pretty faithful to it. But I'm seeing it in a very different way than I was brought up as a fundamentalist. We have time for a couple more, I think. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so if you take, uh, uh, well, the word salvation really is interesting because the word salvation, it, because of our encounter with our Jewish brothers and sisters, after the, largely after the Holocaust, they said to us, you guys have that word salvation all wrong. Salvation derives its meaning from the book of Exodus. It means to be saved from our oppressors. Salvation means liberation. And so the, if, it, that, that, I think the best, one of the best things we could all do is take the word salvation out of the Bible and stick the word liberation in. Because we Christians created this whole imaginary uh, of being saved from hell and being saved from God and all that. But really it means being saved from whatever is oppressing you. If you're sick, you're being oppressed by disease. If you're uh, poor, you're being oppressed by economic structures. And so liberation. But here's the interesting thing. The big term I grew up with as a fundamentalist, and I bet some of you did too, was personal salvation, which is a term you will never find in the Bible. Persons experience salvation, but the idea that it's tailor-made for individuals, I just think, if you start reading the Bible again with that in mind, you'll just see, boy, there's one that came from out, you know, out of left field. Um, so that word salvation is more meaningful to me than ever, but it, it means the liberation from the kind of mess that we see going on in the United States and in the Philippines and around the world right right now. Is that, is it, are, uh, time, I'll, I'll take one more and then we'll, uh, we'll have a break. I, I, I'll come here in just a minute, but um, was there another word you wanted me to? <laughs> Thank you. But I'll, we'll go here right next then. <laughs> yes. The, the question is, what would God 6.0 uh, be like? Um, so let me answer that by, I will not answer that what it is. I'll tell you what, I th what I'm thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about people like uh, St. Francis, who, uh, uh, when he went out and saw the flock of birds in the grass, he thought, there's Sister Sparrow. And there's Sister Swift and Swallow. And there's, you know, Brother Magpie. And, there, and, and he saw, a, I don't think that was just rhetorical. I think he, he felt and experienced his kinship with all of those creatures. Uh, and I think that this is maybe the, the, our next step. We, we have a long way to go just looking at all human beings as relations, as, as a big us. But I think that starts to expand to all living things. And then I think it expands to all things, known and unknown. And, uh, and I, I wish I had the slide to show you, but I'd love to bring a, a quote from uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky in The Brothers Karamazov for Father Zosima says, uh, he says, love everything. Uh, and as you love it, if, as you love any particular thing, a leaf, a flower, a rock, if you start loving it, you'll begin to love it more and more and more. And then you will begin to love God. Uh, because in the act of love, Whatever we mean by God is what we experience in the act of love. I have a feeling that's where that, where that goes. Yeah. Maybe that's a good place to break for lunch. We'll have plenty more time to talk this afternoon. Thank you. Okay.